Welcome to week six of the quarter. And as you may remember back on week four, uh, we looked at Paul's doctrines of justification and sanctification. And this week, I want to focus uh, more exclusively on Paul's uh, view of sanctification in the life of the believer, and in particular, uh, the place that this doctrine fits into what Christian theologians refer to as the order of salvation, or sometimes you'll see it in Latin, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. Uh, and so uh, I want to focus on the relationship between the role of God and the role of the believer in the progressive nature of our growth and holiness and, and Christ-likeness. So we're going to be looking um, a little bit at Philippians chapter 2. You can have your Bible open there. <clears throat> uh, I've pulled off my shelf Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. And in his uh, systematic theology, you'll see this uh, order of salvation. Uh, and you'll find this in most uh, any uh, Christian systematic theology text, where we look at uh, the doctrines included in the doctrine, overall doctrine of salvation, uh, beginning with election all the way through to glorification and what each of those doctrines is. Now, I'd love to have time to speak to you uh, in depth and thoroughly about each of these doctrines. And I want to talk about those a little today, but again, I would encourage you to, to pick up Grudem's Systematic uh, Theology and have it on the shelf for as, uh, as a reference. And so I, in that uh, order of salvation, each of those individual doctrines is... It's not so much chronological as it is um, logical. It is a logical progression. Many of those uh, acts of God in the life of the believer occur or begin simultaneously. Uh, they happen at the same moment, and some of them continue throughout the life of the believer, and some of them are a one-time event. Uh, like uh, justification, we are declared righteous uh, the moment we trust Christ. Uh, regeneration is uh, is a an instantaneous act of God, and also some of those doctrines are what we refer to in theology as monergistic, and some are synergistic. By monergistic, we mean that one works; God alone does that work. Others we understand from the scriptures to be synergistic. That is, uh, you know, two or more are working together. In this case, the believer cooperating with the Spirit of God uh, in some way. And sanctification does involve uh, responsibility, human responsibility on the part of the Christian. So we're going to look at that now uh, and the Christian's role in sanctification. Now, if you look at Philippians 2, 12 and 13, there is a connection you see in that text between verse 12 and the preceding text uh, as indicated by the conjunction, therefore. Therefore is, when you find it in the scriptures, it is drawing a conclusion. And so you must connect it to what has been stated previously in the text in order to understand the text. And so the section here in Philippians actually began in chapter 1, verse 27, and ends here with uh, 2, uh, 13. And Paul was speaking very practically from 1, 27 through 2, 5, and then he termed, turned uh, deeply theological and now returns to the practical. And here he's drawing logical conclusions from the hymn to Christ in Philippians 2 that we've looked at uh, under Paul's Christology. Paul's referring to the Philippian saints here as my beloved is significant. We should never overlook that uh, descriptor. My beloved. Paul is setting them up for uh, a, you know, the bomb that he's about to drop on them. And here he's speaking to them as those who have been loved specially by God, 
and even Paul. Paul knows an understanding that you are loved by God and what that means is of great encouragement and will serve as a tremendous motivation for obedience. What do I mean? Well, Christians use the words, uh, God loves you, I think far too uh, loosely than we should. We And let me explain to you the degree to which God has loved his children. And so I want to review for you the order of salvation. It begins uh, with the doctrine of election. Now, we should not be scared of the doctrine of election. It's in the Bible. Uh, sometimes uh, people think of the doctrine as if something is, uh, it, it, we're, we're speaking of something outside of Scripture. But the word elect, election, predestined, predestination, choose, foreknown, those types of words are used all across the Scriptures. And so they're biblical words, and it is uh, important that we understand their meaning. What is it all about? Well, it's, it's about love. Romans 8, 29 to 30 says, Paul says, for those whom he foreknew. Now, sometimes uh, some think of the word foreknow in the New Testament uh, as simply meaning God knows the future. Well, God knows the future, of course, because he's omniscient. But God knows the future not just because he's omniscient and he looks into the future and sees something happening, he knows the future because he has planned the future, is what the scriptures teach. And you notice here the word foreknow in Romans 8, uh, 29 and 30 is not used in connection with God knowing what someone is going to do or knowing uh, ahead of time someone's actions. The text says that God has foreknown people. For those, those are individuals, humans, for those whom he foreknew. Now, if you look in a Greek lexicon, you'll find that the meaning of this word foreknow, uh, and it's only used four or five times in the New Testament, and in each context, it, it means or refers to God foreknowing or loving and having an intimate relationship with, with people that he has foreloved and forechosen. So, so for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, this is sometimes referred to as the golden chain of salvation because those doctrines are linked like chain links. They cannot be broken. One is connected to the other, and everyone in this text that is foreknown is predestined, and everyone who's predestined is called, and everyone who is called is justified, and everyone who is justified is glorified. Now, I, I wish I had time to unpack this. I could spend a couple of hours just on those two verses, and we don't have time for that, unfortunately, but... I want you to see how for no is used elsewhere in the scriptures. You see in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, uh, Peter refers to those who are elect exiles according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. See, it's not just God knowing the future. They are elect exiles according to God's foreknowledge. God, the, the elect exiles are foreknown in that they are foreloved for foreknown in an, in an intimate relationship. He, he knows them personally and wants them to be his. 1 Peter 1.20, he, in reference to Christ, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Now, that, that can't simply mean the Father knew something about the Son, that the Father just saw the Son choosing something or doing something or acting in a certain way. It says that he was, Christ was foreknown uh, by the Father from the foundation of the world. Uh, how about Acts 2.23? Uh, Luke says uh, that as the disciples were preaching, um, they said, this Jesus 
uh, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And so there you see the word foreknowledge again in reference to a person, Christ. Um, Matthew one twenty one I think is helpful here. Uh, when Gabriel announced the um, the the birth of, of Jesus, uh, he told Joseph, She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save who? He will save his people from their sins. Not just generic, nameless uh, faces or numbers, but his people. Who are those? Well, John 17, Jesus prays in the garden, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to who? To all whom you have given him. Interesting. Who are those? Well, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, For we know brothers loved by God. Now, how did Paul know that these particular uh, persons in Thessalonica had been loved by God? He said in verse 4, uh, that he has chosen you. How did he know that? Because our gospel came to you not only in word, Right? It didn't just come in, in, in words that fell on deaf ears, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And so we know that the Thessalonian believers were chosen and loved by God because uh, in response to that love and that choosing, they responded to the word of God with power and with conviction. Paul says in uh, at the end of his life, he reflects on his ministry, and he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure everything for the sake of who? For the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So how do the elect come to know that they're elect? Well, Paul said, I endure suffering for them. How? By preaching the gospel and praying for their salvation. God works through those means of my preaching of the gospel and my praying for them to bring his people to himself and to make them aware of what God has done for them and how he has worked and chosen them from eternity past before they even existed. You see, God not only ordains the end, which is the salvation of his people, but he ordains the means to the end, and all the things connected to get them to salvation. Paul says in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, and then verse 11, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why did he choose them? Why did he choose you? that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, not our will, his will. What's the ultimate goal of our uh, election? To the, to, be, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, that's in Christ, in him, that is in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Now, there's people who object to all of this. Oh, this is unfair. Oh, this is unjust. Well, Paul addresses that too in Romans 9, verse 14 and following. He asks, anticipating objections to his teaching on election, and he says, what, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will, right? It didn't depend on your will or exertion or your strength or power or effort. It 
but on God, on God's will, on God's grace, on God's mercy, but on God who has mercy. So then, God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Friends, I know this is hard for us, but it is the word of God. And let's look at it together. He says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Or who can resist his will? And then he answers with a very uh, mouth-stopping response. But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Who are we to talk back? Will the one who is formed say to him who formed him, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay, Paul says in Romans 9. I encourage you to read that whole chapter. And so, in summary, let me say this. The doctrine of election, or election is not salvation itself. It is the blueprint for our salvation. Election is not salvation. Election is the plan. Election is unto salvation. It is what has marked us out to be saved and then God sends the gospel to his people so that we will hear it. And then he sends his power so that we will, we will hear that with the ears of faith and believe it and embrace it. Just like Paul did on the Damascus Road when he showed up and said, said Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul didn't say, hey, give me five minutes to think about it. He said, who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? I am Jesus whom... You are persecuting. So God planned how to make those sinners into believers, and he appointed people like me and you to take the gospel to them. And that's Romans 10. That's Paul's proclamation of the gospel. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, 13 to 15 and verse 17. How are his people, though, going to come to conscious faith uh, without hearing the gospel. Well, he says, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You say, yes, but, but many people hear the gospel who never believe the gospel. Yes. Why do some believe and others don't? Because Jesus said in Matthew twenty two fourteen, for many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, the calling there is referring to the outward external call that we issue forth as Christians, as evangelists, as witnesses. We call everyone uh, to respond to the gospel. And we know that as we scatter the seed of the gospel, God will call his people to himself. Those whom he predestined, he also called. That is the an internal effective call that always is successful because everyone who receives that call, he says in Romans 8.30, those whom he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Paul refers to this uh, internal, effectual calling in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, where we see, uh, again, Paul refers to the Thessalonians as those beloved by the Lord. He says, because God chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this, he called you through our gospel. That's how he saved them. That's how the, the chosen responded and became aware that they were chosen. So through the general call, God issues forth an effectual call to his people uh, that were referred to there in Matthew one twenty one that he came to save, who hear it when God regenerates them. Now, regeneration, you, know, you notice the prefix re means again. Generate means to live, to live again. Regeneration is the doctrine of the new birth. It is being born again. Regeneration is God making a spiritually dead sinner spiritually alive again. 
Now, I think Dr. Schreiner does a really good job of addressing uh, all of this in his textbook, and you may have already read that section. If so, then I hope this will be simply helpful in you in your reading. Uh, because Jesus, um, uh, well, really, really the Apostle John, John 1, 12 and 13, you can look at this, uh, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born. Now, how were we born? Again, not of blood, right? You didn't, you weren't born a Christian by natural birth, nor of the will of the flesh. You did not make yourself born again by your own fleshly power and ability, or uh, nor of the will of man. You didn't will yourself into the new birth, uh, but of God. They were born of God. This is supported again in James 1.18. Of his own will, of the Father's will, he brought us forth. That's the new birth. That's birth language. He brought us forth by the word of truth. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3 and 23, he has, God has caused us to be born again. Just like you were physically born, you didn't, you had nothing to do with being physically born. You didn't choose that you would even be born. Uh, you didn't choose to be born physically. You didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your time of birth, your place of birth, your, any of that. Uh, well, ultimately, this is a monergistic work. God has caused us to be born again. He says, you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. That the word is the means by which we're born again. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4, but God, being rich in mercy, uh, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive. Right? That's the language of, of, a, of, a, of a creator who can make what's dead live again. How about Paul preaching in Philippi in Acts 16? Luke says in Acts 16, 14, that as Paul was preaching, the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart. Lydia didn't open her heart. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. Praise the Lord. He opened my heart. He opened your heart. He made you alive. He gave you the new birth. And what happens when God effectually calls um, sinners to himself? He, they're, they're converted. That's the doctrine of conversion, of turning. We respond to the gospel with belief. Whoever believes in, the, in him will not perish but have eternal life. So it's not just... Whoever, no, it's whoever believes has eternal life. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, that we are, uh, we, we reckon, we come to become, a, we recognize and, and uh, embrace our, uh, our uh, choosing and calling by believing the gospel. All right. Oh, there's so much to cover here. Uh, I just don't, I feel like we don't have even time to get through all of it. Um, so, I, I, I'll, some of this I'm just going to have to leave with you with your notes. Um, but I've given you a lot of, I think, uh, references here where you see that God commands repentance. He grants repentance. He gives faith. Uh, faith is a gift. Um and something changes when the sinner is called by God and given the new birth and is converted. He's, he's justified. Romans 5.1 says that we have been justified by faith. Um, that is, we are declared righteous. Uh, goodness, the, the doctrine of justification is the article upon which the church stands or falls. It's the heart of the gospel, Luther said. Martin Luther said. So, we are at the same moment adopted. Uh, and so still something else incredible happens the moment we're called, regenerated, 
converted, justified, and adopted, we begin the journey of sanctification. So justification, which is salvation from sin's penalty, and sanctification are different, but they are inseparable. They must happen. And so whereas justification deals with your legal standing, sanctification deals with your internal condition. Justification is a one-time act. Sanctification continues throughout your life. Justification is the same for every believer because it's a legal position you have in Christ. Sanctification varies from believer to believer because we are at different levels of maturity and growth. Justification is monergistic. It is entirely God's work. Only God the judge can declare the sinner righteous. But the saint, but in sanctification, we cooperate, we participate, and we are responsible to appropriate the means of God's grace, the word of God, prayer, worship, so forth, disciplines. Now, as true Christians will do, the Philippian Christians were already obedient to God. In verse 12, in Philippians 2.12, he says, as you have always obeyed. So, um, salvation, you know, some people try to say, well, you know, conversion is just like a, a one-time, you know, decision. It's like as simple as putting, you know, choosing a blue shirt today and putting on white socks. Uh, friends, biblically, conversion is a radical a radical reorientation of the sinner toward God. It is a radical response to the gospel that involves repentance and turning and forsaking sin and embracing Christ as Lord. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson said about uh, Philippians uh, and, and Paul's words here, for the apostle, for that is for Paul, for a professing Christian to live in persistent and habitual disobedience was not merely a sign of immaturity. It was an absurdity. I could not amen that more. I want to skip over some things here, and I want to skip over to... Um, I, I, you should have in your notes, I think, letter E. Paul indicates that Christian obedience is the working out of something. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so what Paul does not mean by work out, he is, he is not teaching that our salvation is by works, at least not by our works. Uh, I often tell uh, people we are saved by works. They're just not ours. We are saved by the works of Christ, right? He worked and he merited, he earned our salvation, he accomplished it by his perfect obedience, by doing what we haven't done, succeeding where we have failed. He not only never sinned, he not only never did anything wrong, he always did that which was right. He always positively and actively obeyed and pleased the Father, which we have not done for five seconds in our lives. So he's not teaching salvation by works, neither is he teaching your works add to the work of Jesus uh, or that we maintain our salvation by keeping ourselves saved. No, what Paul means by work out is that we practice our uh, salvation until it has had its full effect uh, and until it has had its full cleansing effect in us and it's a continuous, sustained, strenuous effort that we keep on working out to completion and we continue to work out what God is working in. To work out refers to the continuous outworking of the gospel's power in the daily sanctification of the believer. We are saved from sin's penalty, past tense, and we are presently being saved from sin's power. We are no longer slaves of sin and then we will one day be saved from sin's presence. Again, Dr. Ferguson says, Paul is not thinking here of any good works we may contribute to our salvation, but about how we are to respond to the salvation, which is ours already in Christ. We are not to work for it, 
or work it up, or, or but to work it out. That is to make sure that its influence and implications permeate the whole of our lives. Now let me skip down a little more to God's role in sanctification at verse 13. The word for is significant. Why are we to work out our own salvation? Uh, why are we to cooperate and participate? Because it is God who works in you, right? You're not working on your own. You're working uh, with the understanding that God is at work in you and you are simply submitting or yielding to his work in you. The work of sanctification then is, is synergistic. Uh, that doesn't mean that God and man are equal partners. God is always the one ultimately doing the work, but we are responsible uh, to participate and to appropriate the means by which we grow. Um, and that is to take in the word of God, to pray, to fellowship with believers, to worship, to serve, to share, to witness, uh, silence and solitude, journaling, uh, fasting. These are all means by which God works to make us more like Christ. Oh, there's so much I'd love to say here, but we're at the 30 minute, 31 minute mark. And uh, uh, I'll just have to leave this with you. Uh, and uh, and your reading with you, and we'll pick up here next time uh, in Philippians uh, at another text, and we'll talk again about this doctrine of of sanctification. Uh, God bless you.